This is Research Like a Pro, Episode 35, Church Records, Part 1. Welcome to Research Like a Pro, a genealogy podcast about taking your research to the next level, hosted by Nicole Dyer and Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional. Diana and Nicole are the mother-daughter team at FamilyLocket.com and the creators of the Amazon best-selling book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist Guide. I'm Nicole, co-host of the podcast. Join Diana and me as we discuss how to stay organized, make progress in our research, and solve difficult cases. Let's go. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the show. I'm Nicole Dyer, co-host of the Research Like a Pro Genealogy Podcast, and I am here with accredited genealogist, Diana Elder. Hi, Diana. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. I think I'm finally recovered from Roots Tech. It took me a couple days. How about you? (laughs) Still recovering, getting more sleep. So what did you think of the conference? Well, I think that it was amazing. I went to so many good classes, and it was so great because the classes were bigger this year, the classrooms, so everybody had a seat. And I think that just took the stress level down so much so that we knew we could stop and, you know, go to the expo hall and we would still get into our class and be able to find a seat. So for me, Mm -hmm. that was huge difference. What about you? Yeah, I liked that. So I think my favorite part was meeting so many people and all of you out there who listen to our podcast. Thank you so much for coming up and saying hello. It was so fun to get to know so many more people. And that always happens at these conferences. I just noticed that I really enjoy meeting people who love genealogy as much as I do and networking. (laughs) Yeah, I totally agree with that. It was so fun to have people come up and say, we listen to your podcast or I have your book or I'm in your e-course. Yeah, it was great. And it was super fun when we had our booth on Saturday and we were causing a huge traffic jam because everybody was stopping to buy the book. It was really fun. We loved that day and meeting. (laughs) I think we met like 150 to 200 people in those five hours. It was pretty crazy, but it was so fun. It was fun. What is something that you learned from another class? Because we actually tried to go to a bunch of other classes too. Well, I did two of Blaine Bettinger's DNA classes because Ancestry.com had just released a couple of new tools and I really wanted to learn about those. And I knew that I learned best from just sitting and watching. And then I had my computer open, so I was also trying it at the same time. So the DNA stuff was really exciting for me because I have kind of shied away from wanting to have these extensive spreadsheets of my DNA matches. It's so time consuming. And I've just kept hoping that the websites would come out with better tools. And so ta-da, Ancestry did. And now we can color code our matches and we can see the notes on the screen. So many great things. So I did that class. And then I also, when Blaine talked about DNA Painter, I did a little refresher on that because I've already played with that, but it's always good to reinforce. So I'm going to have to say the DNA classes for me were the most beneficial because that's where I'm really, really excited to put everything to use that I learned. How about you? What was your favorite class? I really enjoyed going to Rebecca Whitman Coford's classes. She's a certified genealogist and I want to be just like her. (laughs) (laughs) She taught about some difficult, more advanced topics. So I I wanted to know kind of how she approached that. And she talked about using voter registration records to help figure out the immigrant origins and naturalization records of our ancestors. And that was a great light bulb moment to recognize that the voter registration records had to be citizens. And so the citizens sometimes had to say which court they did their naturalization papers at. And then I also enjoyed her class about separating men of the same name and her example about the porters. And she talked about how she organized all of the information that she found and she's very methodical and putting everything into different spreadsheets. And she actually used the signatures of the men to differentiate them. So it was very interesting. Yeah, interesting that you brought up Rebecca because I just watched one of her recorded sessions. So everyone listening, you can go on Roots Tech Archived 2019 sessions and you can watch Rebecca's session on social history. And if you've been wanting to write a family history narrative, you know, to finally get that story written about your ancestors, 
Oh my word, this is the one session you want to make sure you watch. She just spelled it out so well about how to brainstorm ideas, how to write it up, how to keep track of your notes. It made me really excited to go write a big book about my ancestors, and I have no time to do that right now, but I really want to do it. And now I have a great resource. So I just want to give a shout out to Roots Tech for recording so many great classes. Oh my word, you don't even have to have gone to be able to go on and get a great genealogy education. Of course, they have previous year's archive too. So really great service to the genealogy community. Agreed. Well, let's jump into today's topic. We are talking about church records today. And before we do that, I guess we'll do our review. The review is from WebFan50. And he said, this podcast has great information for its listeners. Nicole and Diana do a great job with letting listeners know where and how to find information for their genealogy searches. From beginners to advanced, they let you know how to do the correct things to become a better genealogist. Thank you for that review. And I hope all of you guys will write us a review on your podcast app. All right. So church records. We are learning about how to find church records. We're going to do a two-part series. So we'll talk about how to find them in part two. But today we'll talk about kind of the history of the church records, why they're valuable, and what we might find in them. So Diana, can you kind of give us some overview and some history of this? Sure. So in the United States, we know the first settlers came in there in the early 1600s. And if you stop and think about your U.S. history just a little bit, a lot of them were coming for religious freedom. And they were coming and establishing churches here. One of the first things they would do would be to establish their church. And because they had come from England or Germany or Holland, you know, the old country, they were used to keeping records. And so in many of these early colonies, they would establish a state church and they would start keeping a record. Now in New England, we have the Congregational Church. That was the formal state religion for Connecticut, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. So if you have New England ancestors, that's the church you're more than likely your ancestors would have belonged to. Of course, there's those oddball ancestors that weren't with the state religion, but you know that's the basic one for New England. Then we have the Mid-Atlantic and Southern Colonies, and here we have a lot of different religions. So we have the Episcopal or Church of England, which was established for a time as a state church in Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. So kind of think of that little strip going down the Atlantic of those colonies there in the middle of the United States. And that was the state church in those colonies. And only Virginia actually imposed laws about Anglican worship. So if you have ancestors that are in Virginia, By law, they were supposed to record various important things in their life, such as a marriage with that church. So keep an eye out for church records for the Church of England or Episcopal in those middle Atlantic states. Then just keep in mind that people that were coming over here and establishing this new country had very strong wills. And so even though there might have been a state religion, They also wanted to just worship the way they wanted to. And so you're going to have Dutch Reformed, Quaker, Catholic, Lutheran, Jewish, and Baptist. So those are all religions there in the early colonies that your ancestors might have been associated with. So as early as 1632, back to Virginia, ministers were required to keep a register of not only the marriages, but also burials and christenings. Now, the sad thing is that a lot of those records do not exist anymore because if you remember, Virginia was battleground state for the Civil War and a lot of records were lost. But that said, sometimes you get lucky and your county or your little town area, there was something that was saved. And so as part of our reasonably exhaustive research, we need to be aware of this and we need to go looking and see if possibly there is something that survived that would help us. So after the Revolutionary War, things changed. The church was less dominant and people started moving west. So what happened when you moved west? Well, you might have moved to a little town and let's say you were a Methodist and there's no Methodist church there, but you are still a church going person. So you start going to the Baptist church or vice versa, or, you know, you'd be going to a completely different church. 
just because that's the only one that was there. So keep that in mind also that records for your family might be in a different congregation than you might think because there was just not the church they wanted to go to in that area yet. And also out as people were moving west, there was often a circuit riding minister. They called him circuit riding because he'd make this big circuit of the area and people As soon as he would come into town, then they'd have a rush to get married or baptize the children or or what have you. And so he would often keep his own records and they wouldn't be put into the town. He would just keep track of those. And those can be found in manuscript collections or in smaller collections in libraries. And we will talk a lot about where to find church records in our next episode. But just keep in mind. Church records are a little tricky because they're not always where you think they might be. So, Nicole, tell us about what kind of records were created. What are we going to find in church records? Well, obviously, we're going to find anything that has to do with a baptism or christening because when somebody was newly born or joined into that church, they wanted to write down who the new members were. Also, marriages and burials. So, Let's talk about some of those. Each denomination is unique in what they recorded, but a lot of them had their own record books or forms that they would distribute to each parish or each congregation. So if you can find those record books, then you can kind of get an idea of what each record will be like in the future because they were all supposed to use them the same way or the same forms. So sometimes those forms would include the birth dates and the names of the parents or the maiden name of the mother. I have done some research in Mexico and the parish records there for the Catholic Church include the grandparents as well as the parents, which are wonderful when you're looking at the baptism records. So you can get not only the parents of a person, but also all four of their grandparents and additional relatives because of the godparents. So depending on the form that was used and the the standard way of recording the events, you can find different information. So sometimes the dates and the places of these events, like the baptism or the marriage, are all that is included with the names of the couple getting married. But sometimes there will be sponsors or witnesses that are listed on that marriage record or that baptismal record, which may not have the relationship stated, but it could be extended family. So if you just note the names of the sponsors and then do extra research, you can sometimes find out that they were a family member. So we have an example to talk about that is a Quaker marriage record. So when we were at Roots Tech last week, we did the root relatives around me or yeah, the relatives around me feature on the family search app. And so we found like several cousins and some came and found us. And one of them is my cousin, Glenn, who has been doing a lot of research on our Hollingsworth side. And the Hollingsworths were Quakers who immigrated from Ireland, but they were originally from England. And then they immigrated to Pennsylvania with William Penn. So there are a lot of cool Quaker records in our family. And one of the ones that Glenn sent to me last week are some Quaker marriage records. And what he pointed out is that they include a lot of the names of the witnesses who were there at the monthly meeting when the marriage took place. So I thought it would be fun to kind of read through some of this. So it talks about, whereas this couple, the son of so-and-so, and and, you know, it lists the names of the parents of the County of Guilford and state of North Carolina. And then it lists the wife, Miriam, the daughter of Richard and Sariah, of the county and state of Forested, having declared their intention of taking each other in marriage before several monthly meetings of the called Quaker held at their meeting house at Deep River in the said county of Forested, according to the good order among them, and nothing appearing to hinder their procedure therein, were allowed by meeting to accomplish their marriage, which they did at a public meeting in the house of Forested, the 16th day of the fourth month in the year aforesaid of our Lord 1789 in the presence of many witnesses, 12 of whose names are hereunto annexed. 
Phew. I think I did a pretty good job reading that, but some of it was probably butchered. But then there are 12 names affixed to the marriage record. So it's interesting how the Quakers included a lot more witnesses than most marriage records. Another thing that the Quaker marriage and church records will include are the dates, but they only include the numbers for the month. They don't write out the month because they consider that to be pagan. So they would just say, you know, the number of the month, like the fourth month. And that is pretty easy to figure out, except if it's before the year when the years began in March. So before 1750 in England, they were still using the other calendar. Diana, do you remember if it's Gregorian or Julian, which was first? I can't remember. <laughs> I was just going to ask you. I haven't looked at that for a while, so sorry. My my mind is not blank on that one. <laughs> but England adopted the new calendar in 1750, and that's when they started the year in January. So anyway, it's important to know the difference. <laughs> when you're doing that Quaker research. So yeah, what did you think of those Quaker records? Oh my word, I thought those were so fun. I just wish somebody in my family had been Quaker because they kept such good records. And if you can find them, you get a boatload of information. I love that. So yeah, I think church records are so interesting. They're so unique and so different. And one of the ones that I came across was a record in early New York, 1832, that was a list of baptisms. And if anybody has done New York research, you know that it is hard because you don't have any birth records until after 1880. You know, that's not unique. There are a lot of states that do that, but you also don't have marriage records till a lot later. And New York is just tough. So here we go. We have a church record. It's 1832. It's listing the baptism date of each child doesn't have the birth record. So you have to, you have to always study the practice of the religion. So did they baptize infants or did they baptize adults? So knowing that can help you to figure that out. Well, this was congregational and congregational, that de- denomination generally baptize infants. So the really cool thing about this record is it also gives the name of the parent, only the father. But, you know, as we all know, before 1850 and the censuses only list head of household, how valuable is it to have the name of a father. So I love this church record. So helpful. Another kind of record besides the birth, marriage, and death records that, you know, we maybe think that is the most important with church records, but there are other churches that kept membership records. In fact, most of them generally kept some kind of a list. It could have been a census or a register. And these can reveal an individual's residence and actions in between the census years. Don't we wish that we had censuses for every single year? That's why we like tax records because you can sometimes get in between and state censuses can get in between the federal censuses. But keep in mind that a church record can also give you insight in that 10 year range between a federal census. So a church record can also give you some really cool information like where people lived previously, and they can sometimes tell you where somebody moved to. And I love the example. Well, I've got lots of different examples that I have seen, but it's really fun when you find something and it says that a person has been removed. And sometimes it's funny, you'll see something and it'll say they've been excommunicated, which I am always very curious about that. But then often it's just that they've sent a letter on and they have moved to a new county or a new state. And the reason they would send a letter on is so that the new congregation would see that your ancestor was in good standing with the church and that they can just welcome them right in. So you never know what you're going to find. Often these will have little notes from whoever was making the record about the person. And again, you know, always try to find those originals because you never know what's written in the margin, what little details you'll find about your, your person. So one of the records that I used a membership type of record for a case that was really, really helpful was one of those in Virginia. And it was called the meetings of the overseers of the poor. 
and it was for this specific parish. This was Church of England, and it was 1787 to 1819. And it showed all the different people that were paying to help the poor. And it was really interesting because the family I was researching, the father died. And before he died, he was always listed as helping the poor. Well, guess what happened after he died? Then his widow and his children were listed as receiving help from others in the community. So that was so interesting to see the reduced circumstances of the family to go from paying to help others to receiving the help from the community. And I was able to prove that one of the sons of this family was the same man that showed up in Tennessee a few years after 1800 because he completely disappeared from the church records. He went from being named continually and then he was gone about the same time he showed up in Tennessee. So one of those indirect negative evidence type things that we talked about a few episodes again, and it was all from going through these minutes of the meetings in this wow, parish record. That's great. Negative evidence. How interesting. So I just wanted to point out that Church of England and Episcopal and Anglican all refer to the same church, right? Yes, they just use different names. <laughs> it's kind of confusing, isn't it? Yeah. So what was that fictional novel that we read a long time ago about an Episcopal minister in current times? Do you remember that? Oh, that is Jan Karen's series. Yes, that was a fun book. Loved that series. There were several of those books, and I can't think of his name, but yeah, that was what we were thinking of. <laughs> <laughs> I remember learning a lot about the way that the Episcopal Church is run in the present day, and that can help a lot in understanding the past as well. Good point. All right, so let's talk about another example. So you mentioned the parish records and how they had these meetings for the overseers of the poor. But what about uh, just a general membership record list? How could that be helpful? Well, you looked into the Roystons and tried to figure out if they were members of the Baptist church, but we could never find them on any Baptist church membership records, right? Right. But here's an example that we could talk about from Ohio. They have the membership records of the Mount Auburn Baptist Church online that were digitized from a microfilm. And it showed that along with the member's name and their date of admission to the church, they also had the date of removal and where they went, the county where they went sometimes. And if they died, it has their death date. So you might not think to look on a membership record for a death date, but there you go. You might be able to find it on there. So that was a pretty cool record. And for those who moved away, it will say the date that they moved, which can be so helpful, like you mentioned earlier, when you're trying to find out exactly when somebody moved to a new residence, so you can look in that new area for records. And with the loss of the 1890 census, those moves from 1880 to 1900 could be really helpful. So using those membership lists could just give you a lot of information to help fill in that 20-year gap. Right. I just want to mention here, we're talking all about United States church records, but I know a lot of our listeners are researching in other countries. And I just did a project where I was working on a Swedish man who emigrated back and forth several times. He would come to the United States, went back to Sweden, then came again. And one of the key records of that case was a Swedish church record, and it was an immigration record where it named his parents. It named that he was permanently going to Canada. And that was really cool. So you might get immigration information in some of these church records. In fact, you know, if somebody came over from, say, Sweden, and what are they going to do? Who are they going to associate with? Well, they're going to associate with other Scandinavians, other Swedes, people who are speaking their same language where they feel comfortable. So if you're really having trouble finding your ethnic ancestor, church records might really give you the key. And perhaps 
in a church record, it might say where they came from in the old country. And then the old country might have a record of where they're going in the United States or Canada, wherever they're immigrating to. So, you know, just keep in mind that on both sides of the pond, church records could be super helpful in helping you figure out and identifying your, your specific ancestor. Yeah, that's so true. And when you were talking, it reminded me of the research I had done on our third, my third great grandmother, your second, Sarah Jane Miller. And when I was researching her in the LDS church records in the 1850s in Lincolnshire, England, I found on a microfilm a record that showed when she was baptized, who her parents were, which was very helpful because on her birth record, it only shows her mother's name because she was illegitimate. But the church record of her baptism tells her father's name. And the other thing that it said was when she immigrated, because she left in 1856 and joined the Mormon handcart pioneers to come to Utah. But that church record back in England stated her date of departure. So that was really helpful. Right. Isn't that great? It just fills in the story and it helps to give us understanding. And like you said, with the mention of her father giving his complete name, because that was that was kind of a discrepancy in the records, wasn't it? Yeah. So church records are great. Let's <laughs> look at one more example of a membership record. And this is actually a census. This is a Catholic record. This one was in Missouri, 1835 Barron's Parish census. And it was the Church of the Assumption of the Blessed Mary. And this was really important to a, a case that I did for my husband. He had done some work on his Mary Bryan, and he thought for sure that she was the daughter of James French. And I put together all the indirect evidence. And when we discovered the census, she was on there. It clearly listed her as the sister of Monica French. And then guess who Monica French's father was named? It was James French. And so indirectly, that was showing that that would most probably be also the father of Mary. And I loved the census because all the women were named by their maiden name. Really, really interesting. And I've seen that in some other Catholic records that they use the maiden name for the women. So whenever you are kind of puzzled by a church record, it's really helpful to learn more about that denomination and look at all the different types of records that are created by that certain denomination and see if there's a pattern that will help you to understand those records you know, if you're really puzzling Mm -hmm. over something. Yeah, I'm curious why the church took a census of their members, but I guess you could also just call that like a, just maybe like a membership list of everybody who was in their church in 1835, but they called it a census. Exactly. Yeah, just terminology. And that's something to remember that these membership records do have lots of different terms. So here's some of the terms to look for. With membership records, it could be confirmations, communicants lists, admissions and removals, financial records, minutes of various organizations, Sunday school lists, biographical notes on members and pastors, notes on funerals, membership lists, and church-related newspapers. Okay, so there's obviously a wide range in the names of these kind of records. So when you see something, you may think, oh, that's not going to have anything on my family because it's not the list of marriages or deaths or births, but... You're going to want to go explore anything you can find that's in the locality for a church you think your ancestor might have gone to. Right. Okay, let's talk about another kind of record. So that was all about membership records. Now, what about minister records, and how can that be useful? Well, each denomination had its own recording system for kind of keeping track of the church leaders or the ministers. But there could be records that show the appointments, approvals, ordinations, elections, and so forth of the ministers. Now, how could that help? Well, if you are researching your ancestor's fan club, you will want to know who the minister was because he was an important member of the community and an associate of your ancestor. And often entire communities would migrate to a new location and they would all stick together. So if you can kind of figure out that group of friends, associates, and neighbors that were all part of that one minister's group, then you can build a fan club that shows the church or the religion of that group. And then you can follow them through their migration. 
And the religious groups were often really close. In our family, the elder family, my dad's side, they all were Catholics in Maryland who immigrated to Kentucky. So we really have noticed that they married within the same community and migrated together. So that was really helpful to learn about. And then also the research project that I did recently on the Keaton family, I found a marriage record for one of the daughters and it named the minister. And this was in the newspaper that I found it. And the minister had the surname of Gresham, which I had seen in other different places, kind of as a clue leading to a certain candidate for the father and the mother of William Keaton. So that clue, the minister, possibly being a relative or somebody within the community that was related to them somehow, helped me to put together all these indirect clues, which led me to find direct evidence proving that my ancestor was the daughter of William Keaton. So you never know how that minister and his name could help you make connections in your family. So make sure that you learn about the minister and search those minister records because often, especially in the Southern United States, you won't find a lot of membership lists or detailed church records showing baptisms and marriages, but you can usually find records about the ministers and their appointment and their approvals. So look into that. So an example of a minister record is one that we found from the Methodist Episcopal Church. And this was in the Complete Church Register from the Washington Station North Georgia Conference. And this was a digitized microfilm on family search. And so if you were looking at this record, you could trace your Methodist ancestors from Washington County, Georgia, and help determine the pastor responsible for the congregation that your ancestor lived in. So then finding out the name of that minister could lead to possible new clues. So what do you think, Diana? What do you think about these minister records? Okay, I have to tell a funny story here. I had a client project several months ago, and the client had a family story written down that there was a certain surname that they were connected to. And this person was prominent in the War of 1812 when there was a street named after them in Richmond, Virginia, and supposedly he was an ancestor of this family. Well, that surname was nowhere in the county. It was nowhere in the state. There was no connection whatsoever, and I was supposed to find the connection to the surname. So I found one connection to the surname, and it was in a list of preachers. So my hypothesis is that if this really truly is the ancestor, that there was possibly this preacher that came into the area and he was only there for a year. And perhaps he fathered this child with this woman and the story came down with the family that he was the father. I don't know. That's the only connection I found. So, you know, I thought that was kind of funny that possibly <laughs> this was one of those interesting cases and the family just kept saying, yeah, we're related to this famous person. And that's where it came from. I don't know. That's probably going to have to be a DNA study. But I thought it was pretty funny that the only connection I found was this, this traveling minister who was only there for a year. Wow. <laughs> that's my story about registers of preachers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, everybody listening is probably wondering now, how can I find some church records of my ancestors? Well, tune in next week. We will go through how to determine the religion of your ancestor and then how to find those church records that relate to that religion. So our tip is learn about the history of it. And that's kind of what we covered today because you need to really understand what churches were in that area. But we'll talk all about this next time and we're excited to cover it. So have a great week, everybody. All right. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you for listening to Research Like a Pro with Diana Elder, accredited genealogy professional, and Nicole Dyer. We hope that something you heard today will help you make progress in your own genealogy research. If you like what you heard, please leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher, or visit our website, familylocket.com, to contact us. You can find our book, Research Like a Pro, A Genealogist Guide, on Amazon.com and other booksellers. We hope you'll start now to research like a pro.